influence lines. Whether you love them or hate them, you've used them all the time, you've never used them before, we're gonna be going full depth with numerous examples and kind of test problems to test the waters and get you feeling more confident about influence lines. They are something that more so bridge engineers use more often than not, but that doesn't mean that we don't use them in buildings and they can't be another great handy dandy tool in the utility belt as a civil structural engineer out there. So buckle up, let's get going. First off, I gave a couple rules for influence lines and then secondly, we're gonna go through a little test problem, going through a couple different scenarios, you know, doing some different cuts and different locations along this three span beam that I have here. Then after that, we're gonna apply it to one with actual uh, values, do a full influence line, and then effectively use it to calculate numbers you would in the real world. But what are our rules? Well, you, just like anything else we solve for in engineering, most of the time you have reactions, you have shear values, you have uh, moments that you're looking for. And just like influence lines, you have have those categories as well. And for each category, you have a different rule that you're using in order to create your influence line. For the first rule, you need to impose a unit displacement of one unit that one that I put in parentheses is unitless. It's not until later when you actually apply the loading on your system will you, it actually, uh, we use the influence diagram to then spit out an actual value with, uh, you know, with kips or pounds or whatever. Displacement of one unit at the reaction in question. The deflected shape is the influence line. Of the three, this is the easiest one. You only use this rule at your boundary conditions. You know, at A, you have a reaction, B, C, D, we all know this. You can't use the first rule to find, uh, you know, a force or a quote unquote, I'm gonna use this incorrectly, a reaction somewhere along a beam um, because that's where there's shear and potentially moment present in the beam. It's only at a boundary condition do you have a set reaction. Rule number two, shear influence line. So this is just determining shear in your beam along your system here. Impose a unit shear deformation of one unit, and I put in parentheses here, this is my little rule, down and up and you'll see why later. At the point where shear is to be calculated. So at that location where you're trying to figure out how much shear demand do I have, you know, if I go blue, do I have here or over here or over here? Anywhere along your system you can find uh, shear demand and you can use the influence line to determine that. And then lastly, uh, moment influence line. This one I think is, uh, for me personally, I think is the most difficult of the three. Um, this is where you impose a unit rotation deformation that sounds scary, but that's not, it's not too bad. Of one unit at the point where the moment's to be calculated. Same freaking thing. If I go in blue, if we want moment here, if we want moment over here, et cetera, et cetera. You may be trying to answer the question of why do we even need influence lines? Why can't we just use the standard approach and cut our beam and method of sections and stuff like that to determine the shear along our beam, the moment, all that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. An influence line is more so used when you have uh, several loading uh, conditions or criteria. You may have a distributed load and that distributed load is, can be, you know, patterned. So it can be on some areas and not on other areas, as well as a point load that can occur anywhere along your system. And those, then adding those two loading criteria together and all of those combinations of where they could all be. And someone asks you under those loading criteria, what is the worst possible condition, whether it be a reaction, a shear or a moment, anywhere along that beam. If that person's like, what about at C? How bad is it over there if I have, you know, some loading on A to B and some loading on C to D and I have a point load right here. Oh, but actually I changed my mind. What if I actually have a point load here and not here and no distributed load? et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's like a thousand different ways that you'd have to start over and calculate by hand method of sections. This is something that comes up commonly in bridge design, um, lane loading, all that kind of stuff. And uh, when you have multiple spans um, of, of bridges, and uh, you know girder spans and then you have lanes several lanes across one span so this is more so where it comes up but you can use this just like you would in bridges on just anywhere you could in buildings as well where you have a situation like this let's start by saying we want to find the reaction um, at point b and what i would do is i do rb because you're doing reaction 
at point B, point B is actually a boundary condition. We have our system drawn, and just like the rule says, we want to impose a unit displacement of one unit at the reaction in question. I'm gonna go blue here. You erase the boundary condition from the problem. So now you have the following, and you're going to now impose a one unit force. You can think about it like a force because you are displacing this beam upward and in replacement of the boundary condition B. Well, if you take that and you can visualize in your head, if you were to be on the bottom of that beam and you were to point your finger and push up from underneath, what would the deflected shape look like with the boundary conditions that remain? Something like that. And with that quote unquote one, that relays to a total displacement of one unit. And that right there is your deflected shape and that is your influence line for the reaction at B. Well, now let's do RD. So now we're we'll erase this blue line or blue circle and now we're getting rid of that reaction as the rule states and we replace it with an upward reaction of one unit. Pushing upward, what would be our deflected shape? That would look something like this. Drew it a little funky, but it's supposed to cross, obviously cross the plane where you have your reactions. That's where your curvature of your beam reverses at those reaction points because you have a boundary condition, pinning that in place. You now have your influence line for reaction D. That displacement is a unit of one. These are some lesser displacement. So they would be, you know, 0 0.4 and 0.4 something. Do, that's not exactly what they are. I'm making that up, but they are less than one because they are they have less curvature. Because you can ultimately, you can only have your largest displacement of your influence line for reactions of 1.0. That's as large as it can be. All right, so I'm gonna erase those. I think we got reactions. Let's move on. Well, what about VE? So now we're in shear, so now I do V because that's the uh, the shear influence line that we're going for, and E is the point of interest. So that's this guy right here, circle in blue. And as I've drawn here and underlined, E and G are not pins, so they're they are still um, continuous members through those points. Those are just points of interest that I've marked. Those are not actual pins. Our rule is to impose a unit shear deformation of one unit down and up, as you'll see here, at the point where the shear is to be calculated. And E, we will say, for the sake of uh, argument right now, is at mid-span between A and B. So that's uh, a unit shear of one down and up. And that total unit shear is one. When it's centered about your member of interest, it is 0.5 above and 0.5 below. It always equates back to one. You can think of one equaling 100%. And now you need to um, picture as if you're taking this member right here, and I'll actually draw it in red first, and you're slicing it with a knife and you're slicing it right through that point of interest. And now you can think about that member, um, and if you're pulling down and you're prying up on the opposite piece, then from there, you take your deformed shape, and that will give you your influence line for shear. And so that's gonna look like this. So I'll go back to blue. So we're prying down on the left-hand portion of that uh, remaining piece of member, but because this is a pinned connection, it cannot translate any moment about that point, so that member is just going to linearly drop straight down and this boundary condition right here, it's a continuous member over top of it. So that does have the ability to flex and translate moment. So that will not be uh, linear, that will be non-linear. And that will look something like that and do something like that. We're just figuring out how to actually draw the influence lines right now. I think this is a great thing for the PE exam. And actually, I've been going through my studies on the SE exam and been getting all brushed up on influence lines. And that's why, obviously, I'm here today. What about the shear at point G? So if we go back up, again, this is not a pin, but now we wanna know about point G. Let's do it. So point G is right here. Same thing, you're cutting that knife right through point G. Watcha! 
Fruit Ninja, you're going to go down and you're going to go up. I'm gonna actually say point G is over here and we're gonna give some difference. So let's say this is 10 feet total and let's say it's seven and three. So now we're making that cut through there in blue and it's gonna look something. So again, that's gonna go down and you're gonna draw your deformed shape now as if you're prying on those two parts that you just cut through and look something like that. And again, this is a total unit. So if I bring these dashes out. That right there is a total unit of one. But you may notice that the bottom piece of that cut looks deeper than the top piece. And that's because we are no longer at mid span uh, of the member that we cut. We are now, you know, more favored on one side than the other, three feet and seven feet. And how that translate is just through basic geometry and ratioing. So the closer you get to one end, the larger and deeper your influence line is going to be for shear. This bottom dimension is actually 0 0.7 because it's 70% because this is 10 feet total. So it's seven over 10 of our one unit which is 0 0.7, which gets you that. And that means that the top piece is three tenths of our one unit. So the top portion is 0 0.3. Gang, it is literally a thousand degrees in here, but let's keep it rolling. All right, moment influence lines. Oppose a unit rotation deformation of one unit at point where moment is to be calculated. So it's the same process as shear, except you're applying a unit rotation deformation. You're like, ah, it's, you're just, yeah, you'll see in a second here. So let's find uh, the moment about point E. Now I go M E, because we're looking at moment. And this one I think about like kind of strange, but if you were to, you know, take our knife again and you were to cut like 90% of this thing out and then you were to pull up on that piece. So instead of uh, pulling down on one piece and up on the other piece like we did for the shear, we we're gonna cut most of it out, but now we're gonna take both pieces and we're gonna pry them up. All right, so that would ultimately lead to, you know, something like that happening as you pry up on it. But I still like to think about it like there's still a little piece hanging on there, a little paper clip attached. And uh, then you draw the influence line based on the deform shaped by applying that unit rotation. We'd get something like this. Again, there's a pin right here at point A. So it's not a fixed condition, it's pinned, so there's no moment uh, translation right there. So you'd have a linear uplift. But then for the rest, same thing. That's not linear. I know I kind of drew it linear, but this has a, you know, a slope to it. Now I gotta get my butter knife out of the way. And that unit rotation is that value equal to one right there. So it's it's a it's an angle, it's a unit of rotation. And ultimately, there you go. Just like that, you have your um, influence line for your moment at point E. That's all that it is. Where it gets tricky for moment is actually determining um, the values once you start putting loads on them. That's the where I say it's kind of the trickier one of the three in my opinion. But let's do one more quickly. Let's say MB. B is right here. But you're saying, wait a minute, that's not a reaction. What are we supposed to do there? Well, hang on a second. You do the same exact thing. You do like we, we talked about, you know, up here with that kind of that, that thought of how you're gonna cut most of it away and you're gonna, you know, pry it upward but we have that boundary condition that is holding that in place. So there's no way for, like we show up above here, if I go green for ME, we show this like displacement right here of our influence line, lifting up the beam and turning it into, you know, the blue influence line. But for this case, that can't be possible. You can't lift the beam up there because you have a boundary condition uh, that has um, upward and downward capacity. So it's gonna hold that thing in place. So does that mean that you can't do anything? You can't solve for a moment here? No, you, you still can. You still need to picture that you're, you're bending and prying that thing, but you can't actually lift it up. But if your two hands are gripped on the side of it, and you're doing this, ultimately what's going to happen is you're going to get a deflected shape like this. Boom, and your unit rotation is equal to one. That is your moment influence line 
for point B. My explanations took a little bit longer today, so unfortunately I am saving the full-on example problem with numbers until the next video, but I will drop that very soon, so stay tuned. Let me know in the comments down below if uh, you're feeling a little more confident or if you're totally lost with influence lines. I know that I was uh, early on in my career and when I was in school, they, they scared me a lot and I found them to be really difficult. Ultimately, it's the core rules that you just learn and keep under your belt and you just more so think about the system in the physical world. Think about yourself with a little erector set and you're able to, you know, like I said, cut with a knife and pry those things open um, and see how they deform and deflect. That is, uh, that's the best way that I was able to wrap my head around this stuff. And by the way, before I go, we are quickly approaching 8,000 subscribers, which is so, so freaking cool. 8,000 engineers from around the world. Obviously, if you like the content, like it. If you didn't, well, still like it because I'm out here sweating a ton and it's really hot and I'm you know trying my best I don't know and if you want to consider supporting the channel to create more content for all of you better better quality better explanations consider joining Team Castiva see everybody peace